The title of this one, <coughs> I'm sorry, of this message is Under Pressure. And then it has a question mark. It says, Under Pressure, question mark, plant, exclamation mark. Be not deceived, God is not marked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's from Galatians 6 7. We all know that. So, don't lie to ourselves, that's what God is saying. Don't lie to yourself, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man, so only that you reap. You can't reap it. That's the only time where God says, What you sow is what you reap in this life. You sow your time, God will give you long time. You sow your money, God gives you finances in a time like this. And God gives you the money that you want, hallelujah. The amount that you need. If you feel like you're under pressure these days, you're not alone. Satan is putting more pressure on people right now than ever before. He's pressurizing us mentally, financially, emotionally, and in every way he can. Have you noticed sometimes you suddenly feel like uneasy or maybe worried about something? These are all conversations of the devil that you need to cut off in your life because you are a, a kingdom sower and whatever you sow, you reap. If you sow to finances, you reap finances. You sow to spend time with God's word, you reap faith. You listen, you come to church and God says you listen to his word, you reap faith. You'll never be afraid. Because we have to remember Satan is also under attack of our mind. Because there's people that are getting depressed, people that are scared in these times, people that don't know whether they should come to church or not. But I can tell you, I can show you, those people watching online, yes, you, 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 you don't have to be afraid. When you come to church, you make, a, you make a, 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 a determined move to move these feet that God gave you. And I'm telling you, you walk in hell. Sickness can, will not visit you. Many people are, uh, are now having flu, flu symptoms. So let's be realistic. When you've got Jesus in you, you won't be afraid. Hallelujah. And those things won't attack you. The pressure has gotten so great everywhere that governments don't know what to do. Businesses don't know what to do. We hear of companies closing down. I just heard of one. And that's so sad because people losing jobs in times like these, people that were in jobs for 10 years or more or 20 years. So we must thank God for our job. Don't be ungrateful. Let's thank God. Let's give a God a hand for our job. Because even in times like these, for God to open the door for us, it is, I want to say thank you, Jesus, for opening the door for me. Because, yes. brothers and sisters, when others are closing, God's opening doors. Do you understand that? Yes. Can you see the magnitude of that? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, I, can't, I, can't, I can't explain this. I don't know. I just know that I'm a kingdom sower and God provides my needs. Hallelujah. We serve the right God. When you come to clean the church, when you come to do something for God, God makes a way for you. When you come to, to just come to service, to sit on the chair, God sees everything you do when you come to sing and think nobody is listening to you, you don't need anyone. You are singing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is behind the last when you get up at night to pray to God. God sees you. God sees a woman that is that is put a heart and a soul to him. Churches don't even know. Yes, some churches don't even know whether they're going to keep the doors or the door shut. But I thank God for open doors, hallelujah, where we can worship the Lord. Somebody asked me, are we going to close the church? And I said, no, we don't close the church. Unless it's government legislation, we can keep it open. Hallelujah. We're not afraid. But praise God, Jesus does. He knows. That's what he's saying here. Praise God, Jesus does know. He, he says we can give our way, um, our way right out from under any pressure the devil brings to beat. Giving is always Jesus' way out. Wherever there's a need, he plants seed. In fact, in Mark 4, he compares the kingdom of God to a seed. Just think about the importance of seeds for a moment. 
Every little thing on earth comes from a seed. You came from a seed. Then you were born again from the seed of God's word. Jesus himself was a seed planted by God. God sowed him in sacrifice. He came forth and grew up many brethren. So when Satan puts you under pressure, go to Jesus and let him tell you how and when to plant. If you do it, that seed will grow up until it breaks the powers of darkness and black. It will release you from the pressure the devil's been putting on you. I've seen it happen. When Jerry Savile, another mighty man of God, began, first began to work for ministry, he didn't have but one suit of clothes and one shirt and a pair of slacks to his name. He wore one and then the other night, after night, to every service we held. He didn't have the money to even think of, of buying another suit. I'm telling you, he was under pressure with clothes being concerned. Then he found out about the principle of seed faith and harvest. So he went down in the city where he where sorry he went down to the city where we were in a meeting and found a fellow on the street who, he, who needed clothes and gave him some. Imagine that. Immediately people started giving Jerry clothes. It started in that meeting and they've been doing it ever since. Today there are many preachers in Africa wearing Jerry Savile suits. Even if the sleeves and pants are way too short. Even if the sleeves and pants are way too short, that's what he said. He's still sowing and reaping the greatest clothes harvest I've ever seen. If the devil's pressurized pressuring you, don't panic. Plant. Plant your time. Plant your money. Plant your clothes off your back. When, when your harvest comes, you can laugh and say, Hey devil, who's feeling the pressure now? Hey. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity, O oh God, to hear your word. Father, according to your word, where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of me. We acknowledge your presence in this place. We acknowledge and we confess and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the Son of God, the Messiah, our Redeemer and our Savior. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you live forevermore, constantly making intercession for us. Thank you that you are our great High Priest and our Advocate with the Father. Thank you this morning for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord of God, we thank you this morning but each and every individual is precious in your sight, O oh God. These are your people, O oh God. These are your sheep. I pray in the name of Jesus, as the word of God comes forth, that every person, O oh Lord, be filled with faith. Let them be filled with hope in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, and in Christ Jesus, we have received a living hope, O oh God. And we thank you, Lord, for the glorious future that you have prepared for us. We thank you, Lord, O oh God, for predestination and preordination, O oh God, which you have given unto us in Christ Jesus, your Son. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I thank you, Lord, and every mind will be transformed and renewed by the word of the living God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Almighty God, we thank you now. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We acknowledge you. We pray that you will have complete control of this meeting. In the name of Jesus, let the word of God flow freely, unhindered, O Lord God. Let it come forth, O Lord God, steadily, mightily, in the name of Jesus. Let your word be sown on the fertile ground of our hearts this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I thank you this morning, O God, for your precious word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. All the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God.
But as you take your seat, just wave to the person next to you and just say, God bless you. Welcome in the presence of the Lord, in His presence. The Bible says there is fullness of joy. Our joy is full this morning. I say our joy is full this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I love that word that Pastor Sharon shared with us. Something that caught my heart, caught my spirit, is planting is God's way out. And especially in the days that we are living in, it, it's important to be planted in God. Hallelujah. I say it's important to be planted in God. Amen. Amen. If you're planted in the world, you're going to partake of everything that's in the world. But if you're planted in God, Amen. come and talk to me, somebody. I was listening to a man of God ministering yesterday on television. And it was a sermon that was recorded in 1974. That's a sermon I was listening. And um, he says this, he says, you know, many people don't know the will of God. Many people question the will of God. And as I've mentioned to you many times, he confirmed it, that the will of God is the word of God. If you want to know the will of God, read the word. And this is what he said, is that many times people often think that they're going to pray out of his will. And he said something that, you know, caught my spirit and caught my attention. And what he said was, when you are in fellowship with God, it is impossible to pray out of His will. I like that. When you are in fellowship with God, it is impossible to pray out of His will. Because when you're in fellowship with Him, that's His will for you to be in fellowship with Him. So naturally, that is natural. Prayer becomes, you know, you may look at prayer as being something natural, but it is something supernatural. And to a child of God, the supernatural is second nature. Come on, somebody. Say the supernatural is second nature to me. Amen. Now, I want to pick up from last week. I began teaching on the subject of the keys to turning hopeless situations around. Hallelujah. The keys to turning hopeless situations around. I shared with you from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, the man whose son had been tormented by an evil spirit, and how Jesus says something to him very profound. Jesus says, All things are possible to him who believes. Amen. Hallelujah. All things are possible. The word possible means. Um, it means an, an enablement. It means it is able. It means it's something that can be realized. Something that can happen. Hallelujah. And then I want you to go with me to the book of Isaiah 38. I'm going to pick up from there. Um, we looked at the account of King Hezekiah. Now, Isaiah 38 from verse number 1, the Bible says, In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. Hezekiah was sick and near death. He was on his deathbed. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to the king, Hezekiah, and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, you shall die and not live. Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Set your house in order because you're going to die. In other words, get your will ready. Get your successor ready. Because you are about to die. Amen. Your throne will be taken from you. The Bible says, Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly, the Bible says. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Now watch this. Immediately, 
the man of God comes to deliver the message to the king and he tells the king that, you know, get your house in order because you're going to die. Get your successor ready because you're going to die. As the man of God is walking out of the palace, he's still in the courtyard, the word of the Lord comes to him and says, Go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. Amen. Wow, praise God. You see, Hezekiah didn't have a pity party. Hezekiah didn't start crying. Hezekiah didn't start, you know, pleading with the man of God. Um, I, please, prophet of God, please, man of God, please pray for me. Please, maybe God will hear your prayer. I need you to stand for me. Please, maybe God will change his mind. He didn't go and look for a doctor. He didn't go and look for a philosopher. He didn't go and look for an institution. He didn't go and look for somebody that could turn his situation around. He didn't look for somebody that would come and talk to me, somebody that would change God's mind. No, he turned his face toward the wall. In other words, he cut himself off from the rest of the world and he turned to the wall. Hallelujah. And the first key I shared with you last week was, can you believe? That was the first key. Do you remember that? Can you believe? Hallelujah. The second key I shared with you was, what do you see? Hallelujah. What do you see? I shared with you about Moses. Moses had to turn to the Lord. When, come and talk to me. He had to turn to the Lord. David. David had to turn to the Lord. And Ziklag. David had to turn to the Lord and found his strength in the Lord. And those who sought to stone him could not stone him because he turned to the Lord. It doesn't matter what enemy you are facing. It doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in. If you turn to the Lord, things will turn around. Hallelujah. The Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His plan and purpose. Talk to me, somebody. My question to you is, do you love God? Do you love God? If your answer is yes, then that means all things are working together for your good. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, we, 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 we sang that song, You My Redeemer. Many times we say the Lord is our Redeemer, He's our Deliverer. Hallelujah. And He rightfully is. He truly is. When He says, I am your Deliverer, He's telling you, listen, your life as a believer is not going to be all a bed of roses. There are going to be some thorns. It's not going to be an easy road. It's not going to be an easy life. But he says, I am your deliverer. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says a righteous man may fall seven times, but he'll rise again. Amen. The Bible in the book of Psalms says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Praise God. The Lord delivers him out of them all. And if God delivers you, that means no matter what you find yourself in, God is with you. God is well able to deliver you. Hallelujah. He says, I am your deliverer. I will deliver you. He says, I am your healer. When he says, I am your healer, it may, come and talk to me, somebody. It means that, yes, although you may, you may experience symptoms, you may experience the symptoms, but he's your healer. You gotta hold on to your word of healing because you were healed by his stripes at Calvary's cross. Talk to me, somebody. Yes, sickness will come, but God is still with you, and God will still heal you. When the doctors give up, when medical science gives up, when the world gives up, when everything else is failing, when everything else is giving up, let me tell you, God still is. Hallelujah. Praise God. I shared with you the account of Martin Luther who went into a room and one of his ministry helpers was, was ill. And Luther didn't know what to do and all he did was pray the promises of God. He only prayed the promises of God. 
And praise God, God says in his word, remind me. Remind me. And God came through. God healed him. The third key that I want to share with you is plead your case. Plead your case. Hallelujah. Plead your case. That's the third key. If we go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. Woo, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43 and verse number 25, the Lord God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I, even I, am he. He says, I am he who blots out your transgressions. Amen. For my own sake. It means it's not your mother that will blot out your transgressions. It's not your father that will blot out your transgressions. It's not your husband. It's not your spouse. It's nobody but God. He says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. He says, I will not remember. Listen, God is saying, I will blot out your transgressions. I'll remove them. As far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your transgressions from you. Talk to me, somebody. And then he says, and I will not remember them. He doesn't remember them. He says, put me in remembrance. Put me in remembrance. I want you to highlight that. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. You see that? Our relationship with God, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, our relationship with God works like this. We are co-workers together with Him. We are co-workers together with Him. You see, God's part is God says. Our part is just to believe what He says. Amen. You see that? Our part is not to do. God says, I will do. He says it. Our part is to believe what God has said. And once you believe what God has said, you allow God to do it. Hallelujah. A man of God by the name of Charles Finney, who was an attorney by profession, he said something. He said, argumentative prayers are the best kind of praying. Argumentative. You see, he was a lawyer. So what do lawyers do? They look at the facts. So that's how they base their argument in any case. It's the facts. So whatever you are facing in your life, hallelujah, you look for the promises of God. If it's lack that you are facing in your life and poverty, go for the promises on wealth and abundance and provision. Come and talk to me. If it's weakness, look for the promises of strength. If it's sickness, look for the promises on healing. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. For everything we face in our lives, the Word of God has it covered. There's nothing that happens in your life that the Word of God cannot fix. So you take the Word of God and you start looking for the promises. And you write down the promises. And yes, you can look at the facts that you see. But the Word is truth. Truth always overrides fact. Fact needs to be proven. Truth cannot be proven because it's truth already. Hallelujah. So you start speaking the words of God. You start, you see, when God says, state your case. In other words, what have I said? Remember what he said? Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous when he spoke to Joshua? Have I not commanded you? God is saying to you this morning, have I not commanded you? So you go to the word of God. They say, Lord, you said. 
This is what your word said, and that is what Martin Luther done. Talk to me, somebody. All the promises of God, where God promises to hear our prayers and answer them, write them down. Talk to me, somebody. He says, let us contend together. Shit, state your case that you may be acquitted. State your case. Lord, you said. Lord, you said. Lord, you said. Lord, you said. Listen, listen, listen. When you say that, what you're saying is, Lord, I'm not going by what the world is saying. I'm not going by what the media is saying. I'm not going by what medical science is saying. I'm going by what you say. Amen. Lord, you say. Come and talk to me. That's why I love the, you know, the word of God says, thus saith the Lord. It doesn't say, thus said. Thus saith is present continuous. It means what he was saying in Genesis, he's saying it now. What he was saying in Exodus, he's saying it now. Come and talk to me, somebody. What he was saying in Acts, he's still saying now. What he says in the, in the gospel, he's still saying now. Talk to me, somebody. He doesn't change. His word never changes. Hallelujah. Praise God. He says, declare your case so that you may be acquitted. State your case. In other words, God wants you to present those troubles to him. You see, sometimes you find people, they say, um, Although I'm not yet ready. Let me tell you something. If you're going to wait for perfect conditions, they're never going to come. They're never going to come. Hallelujah. You'll get nowhere. He says, come as you are. Bring your case. God is waiting for you to bring your case. Because when you bring your case to him, what you are stating is, Father, I cannot do anything about this, but you can. You see, that was Hezekiah's... Uh, uh, mindset was that no doctor can help me no man of God can help me it's only God who can help me talk to me somebody amen, amen. and the reason why many of us don't get results is because of two things and the first thing is we don't turn our face to the wall and look to God and God alone that's the first one we don't, we don't turn our face to the wall. We don't, we don't cut off from the situation and look to God and God alone. Because many times, we're looking for someone to be with us. Hallelujah. The second one is that our praying is not if intense enough. Our praying is not intense enough. You know, if we don't watch out, our prayers can become just ordinary and mundane. It's just, you know, I pray for the sake of praying. It's just something I do. Praying is where we interact with our Creator. It's where you can take your natural and bring it before a supernatural God so that you can release the super in your natural. Prayer is a divine exchange. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It means with your prayers, you're going to get things done. Talk to me, somebody. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are righteous. So if the Bible says the effective, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman avails much, that means when you begin to pray, you begin to shift things in the heavens. And bring them to fruition on the earth. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. You know, I remember a few years ago, um, I, I lost my father, my biological father, a few years ago. But about two, two and a half years before his passing, he was admitted to hospital. And I remember that time, he, it, it didn't look like he would make it. It didn't look like he would pull through. And every day we'd go, we'd have communion. And, uh, you know, there were some men of God, you know, that school with my dad. One of them ministered at his funeral, and they would go and visit. But the thing is, 
what happened was we all together as a family and you know with people we began to join hands and we turned to the wall. You see when the doctors are telling you that you know there's not much they can do and the nurses tell you there's not much they can do you know very often your mind will become overwhelmed and if you believe that report if you believe that report it will cut off it will cut off whatever blessing God wants to release so we pray we turned our face to the wall and we prayed and you know what happened God gave my dad another two and a half years Amen. come on trust me somebody Hallelujah. That's the Lord. Hallelujah. He gave him another two and a half years. And now someone may say, but well, oh, that's not much. But hey, you know, when a person's supposed to be going today, and God says, okay, I'll give him two and a half years. That's a lot. Two and a half years. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. So God still comes to but That's the thing. you got to turn to the wall. you got to look to God. And God alone. And you've got to pray. Hallelujah. Amen. It's so important. Praise God. I mean, God said to Hezekiah through the prophet, I mean, the prophet was still in the courtyard. So my question is, how many minutes do you think it took? If Hezekiah, come and talk to me somebody else. If Hezekiah was praying to the Lord, how many minutes did it take to turn the situation around? It took seconds. It took seconds because the man of God was... Told. It didn't take hours. It didn't take a day. It didn't take a week. It didn't take a month. It didn't take a year. The man of God was still in the palace. He was in the courtyard, still on his way out. And God heard and God answered. And God said, no, 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 Isaiah. Turn around, go back and tell Hezekiah, I've heard your prayers, I've seen your tears, talk to me somebody, I'm going to give you 50 more years, I believe in this hour that God is going to give you more time, talk to me somebody, God is going to give you more time, praise God, more time for his glory, hallelujah, it's for his glory. Jesus in Matthew's gospel said, oh, come and talk to me, somebody, the kingdom of God suffer violent, and the violent take it by force. It means how desperate are you? How determined are you? Are you like that woman with the issue of blood and said, I don't care what it costs. I don't care if it costs me my reputation. The woman with the issue of blood had no rights. She had no rights. But she said, enough is enough. The doctors have given up on me. Mankind has given up on me. Everybody's given up on me. I may be considered to be an outcast. But I don't care, I'm going to press you. If only I can touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made well. If only I can just touch. You see, when you pray, are you praying out of fear? Or are you praying out of faith? You see, faith, faith doesn't beg. Faith doesn't beg. Faith is bold. Faith is audacious. Faith commands. Lord of Ashiana Kumoskata. If you can begin to see that, if you can begin to understand that, that when you pray, heaven moves on your behalf. When you listen, God is your father. He's your father. When you pray, your father hears you. And if he hears you, he answers you. You serve a prayer answering God. But 
one man's prayer, the heavens were shut for three years. The very same man's prayer again opened the heavens. The Spirit Himself makes intercession on our behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. When you find yourself praying and you don't know what to say and you're just in your prayer closet and you're just... Mm, mm, Man, I can't see it in my natural, but my supernatural, I can see it and man, I can grab a hold of it. Mm, I can grab a hold of it. I see myself grabbing a hold of it. I see the answer. And when I say in Jesus' name, he says, whatsoever you ask in my name, it shall be done for you. Whatever you ask in my name, in my name, in my name, in my name. Church, we have a name that is above every name. The name of Jesus will open doors. The name of Jesus will shut some doors. The name come and talk to me, somebody. God has given us a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord unto the glory of God the Father. You are not an ordinary individual hallelujah you're a child of the living God you're walking in fellowship with God hallelujah God is the same he's the same the same God that was there with Hezekiah he's the same God who's with you here today He's the same God that Hezekiah prayed to. He's the same God that Martin Luther prayed to. He's the same God that Smith Wigglesworth prayed to. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But God, there is no shadow of telling. He doesn't change his mind. Someone may say, but look at what the Bible says. God sent the man of God to go and tell the king his days are numbered. To tell the king this is D-Day. And then all of a sudden God changes his mind. No, God didn't change his mind, brothers and sisters in Christ. God never changed his mind. The fourth key I want to share with you is correct your situation. Correct your situation. That's the fourth key. Correct your situation. You see, when you read the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul writes to the church in Galatia and he tells the church to stand, stand fast. Stand fast. Tell somebody, stand fast. Stand fast. Stand fast. Listen, to every battle and to every victory, there's a Godward side and there's a manward side. To every battle and to every victory, there's a Godward side to fighting the battle and there's a man with side. To every victory that is to be gained, there's a God with side and there's a man with side. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's what I shared with you earlier on. You and I have a part to play in God's great plan of redemption, you and I have a part to play. It's not all God and it's not all you. We are workers together with God. You see, if you don't invite God to the battle, God won't, you won't fight it for you. You see, if 
If you don't give it to God, He can't do anything with something that's not His. You've got to make it His by giving it to Him. You see, that's your part. He says, state your case. Bring your case before Him. And then you come with the promises. Lord, you say, I'm bringing this, but Lord, I'm not looking at this. I'm looking at your word. You say, this is what you say. You see, that's how you weigh the scales of balance. State your case that you may be acquitted. State your case that you may be acquitted. Hallelujah. God never changed his mind. God wanted to bless King Hezekiah so much. There was so much that God had for King Hezekiah, for him to enjoy. But Hezekiah's present state only allowed him to enjoy whatever benefits God had for him up to that point, up to those present circumstances. Ah, you're not kidding. You see, what you are doing under your present circumstances, that is the amount of benefit you're going to receive. Hezekiah had to get to a point where he had to change. You see, the problem is many times we find that people want to change God. They want to change God. They think they can change God. No, you can't change Him. He's the ageless one. The ageless one. The ancient of days. It doesn't change. You can't change God. And you can't use the word of God to change God. The Word of God is there to change you and I. You ask me, many times people want to change God. They think by, you know, using the scriptures. No, no, no. You don't listen. You don't take scripture, you know, and look at it just on the, you know, on the face value. You gotta go deep. You gotta go deep. Don't choose one or two verses and think, oh, that sounds good enough. Maybe this will work. No, you got to take the whole story, the whole package. What did the, did the Apostle John say in the book of Revelation? Cursed is the man who adds or who takes from this book. Don't add. Don't take. Everything is there. It's complete. Take the word in its entirety. Don't take the word of God and want to condition the word of God to your circumstances. No. You've got to take the word of God and you've got to allow the word of God to change your circumstances and your circumstances will change when you change. You see, it's a matter of the heart. Hezekiah reminded God of how he walked before God, how he served God. Probably at that point, Hezekiah came to understand that my own sin, my own foolishness, my own wrongdoing has brought me to my deathbed. But I need to humble myself and pray and seek the face of God. I need to repent. Turn away. Turn away. Not turn around. If you turn around, you're still looking in the same direction. To turn away means to turn your back to and turn towards. To turn away from his own from his own old condition, from sin, and turn to righteousness, the righteous God, the righteous judge, the righteous, the righteous ruler. So when you turn to God. And he began to weep before God. You see, when his heart, you see, your heart needs to become pliable. When, 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 when you allow your heart to be softened by the word of God, 
then God can start working with you. It's all about your character. Tell somebody it's about your character. You see, Hezekiah had a part to play in his deliverance, in his healing. He had a part to play. You see, very often we're looking for a preacher or a man of God or a prophet or somebody to do it for us. Because you find some people have this mentality that, hey, you know, if pastor prays for me, God will hear the pastor. Listen, the same God who hears the pastor is the same God who hears you. I shared with you last week about that woman, the testimony of the woman who received the healing, not by Papa Hagen, but by one of his ministry workers. God has no favorites. There is no favoritism with God. He's the same God. What you did for the one, you'll do for the other. God hears your prayers. You see, yes, we, we teach the principles of how we can carry each other in prayer and faith. But listen, when it comes to this Christian life, there's no hitchhiking. When you're going on the road and somebody has got a cardboard like this, and on the cardboard is written MD, where are they going to? What are they doing? They're hiking. And when it's MKR, where are they going to? What are they doing? Hiking. In this road of faith, you begin there. You begin there. Saved. You need to be saved. Someone comes and ministers the gospel, you get saved. Amen. Healing. Amen. You need healing. Someone stands in the gap for you and prays for your healing. Like the men who brought the paraplegic and broke open the roof and laid him down and set him before Jesus. That's how you carry each other. But listen. Isn't it more? Listen. Is it more enjoyable standing in the sun, in the heat of the day, standing in the cold, facing the wind and the rain, getting drenched in the rain, and standing from early hours of the morning to late at night, you're still standing there, hitching for a ride and nobody's come to pick you. Is that better or is it not better? To get into your own vehicle and drive yourself to where you're going. Which is better? To get in your own vehicle. Because any time I need it, I can get into my vehicle and I can go. What I'm trying to demonstrate is, you cannot ride on somebody else's faith all the time. You've got to get to a point where you get into your own prayer closet. And you turn the ignition, run, 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 and you go. You need healing, you get yourself healed. You need provision, you get your provision. You need deliverance, you get your deliverance. Are you hearing me, somebody? Hallelujah! This vehicle of faith is an awesome vehicle. Hallelujah! You see, you get those that are hitching rides. Then you get those that are waiting on a taxi. But start somewhere. Maybe you start with a bajaj. Oh, you don't know what's a bajaj. It's the latest trend. It's one of the cheapest brand new cars in South Africa. They're watching down in Australia. This year the guys are asleep. <laughs> You may start with a bajaj, but praise God, you can still get there. Praise God, you can still get there because in the bajaj, you're going to pass them folk that are hiking. You'll encounter the hikers in your bajaj. 
But you got to grow your faith. Don't just stay there. Grow your faith. Woo, glory. Then you get to a level, brothers, Jimmy, when your level of faith is a Bugatti for all. Circumstance, man, 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 you don't have to still get to the car like of a judge and try and open the door, it falls and open. No, 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 no. You face with a circumstance, you press the remote and the car opens, you get in, and you yeah. what I'm saying is when you get to the sea, you're not looking around for someone to help you. You say, in the name of Jesus, you become like the prophet who said, Where is the God of Elijah? And he struck the waters. Are you hearing me, somebody? Yeah. It wasn't the man of God who did it. Ezekiel was, uh, sorry, Hezekiah was the one who had to turn to the wall. Hezekiah was the one that had to pray to God. Hezekiah was the one who had to cry before God. Hezekiah was the one who had to change. The man of God could not change it for him. Hezekiah had to change. Hallelujah. So you've got to correct your situation. Correct your situation. You cannot hold hands with the devil and God at the same time and expect God to come through for you. No! You've got to let go of what? You choose. You choose. And I would and I pray to God that it wouldn't be the hand of God that you let go of. You hold on tightly to his hand. You wrestle with him. You say, Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'll not let you go until you come through for me. I'm not letting go because God is coming through for me. Come on, somebody. Come and just do this. Say, I'm not letting go. Until God brings me through. And even when he brings me through, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. Yeah. You know the glory of this vehicle of faith is that you don't get into the driver's seat. You get into the passenger seat. Because you have a driver, his name is Jesus. You see, he's driving, and you're just enjoying the view, enjoying the scenery. Many times we're driving, we're going somewhere. Pastor Sharon and the boys say, look at that, that's so nice. And I'm still, wait, 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 wait. By the time I look, it's gone. You see, but when you're sitting in the passenger seat, Enjoy the ride because it's all God and it's not you. When you're looking to the wall, it is all God and it's not you. I shared with you that man of God who was, you know, from London who was looking out and see. Someone asked him, What do you see? He said, Only God. Only God. I only see God. I only see God. Hallelujah. The, the last point, the last key is you are God's favorite. You are a favorite of the Father. You see, you're not going to receive any deliverance or any help from God without developing your own faith. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For those who come to Him must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Be diligent in your faith. Be diligent. Be steadfast. God loves you. He doesn't love one person more than He loves the other. He loves us all equally. Talk to me, somebody. I shared with you last week about parents grandparents, uncles, aunt, relatives, about mere men, people in verses who have their favorites. 
They favor this one more than the other. No, with God, we are all equal. Hallelujah. Praise God. Every one of us is his favorite. Hallelujah. Can you say that? I am his favorite. Amen. Praise God. Let us stand. We're going to close with a confession this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Say this with me. I'm a child of God. He is my father. He is my very own father. I am his very own child. Turning hopeless situations around. I am a favorite with my father. We are all favorites with him. He loves every one of us with the same love. He will hear every one of us pray. My father loves me. My father hears me when I pray. My father answers. Oh, hallelujah. He is my father. He is my God. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I am accepted in Jesus. He has made me acceptable in the beloved of God Most High. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And whilst we're in the same spirit, oh Lord, I pray for your people. I pray that you touch them. I pray that you revive them, refresh them, oh God. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, as they turn to you and look to you. I thank you, Lord, oh God, that you are prayer answering God. You will hear from heaven, oh God, and you will answer them when they cry out unto you. In the name of Jesus. As you were with Hezekiah, so shall you be with your people this day. In Jesus' blessed name of God, we pray. We give you thanks, we give you praise, glory, honor. We give you all the worship of God. In Jesus' blessed name. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost, rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' blessed name, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life as you continually dwell in the house of the Most High God, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' wonderful name, all the people of God said, Amen, 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 Amen.